One. Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation, I'm your host Alan Sakian. Today we have the incredible pleasure of sitting down with Tony Lane Casserly. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Thank, Thank you for, for coming on the show. Me. Really appreciate Thank it. Okay. Yeah. This is going to be so much fun. We're going to be talking about the importance of decentralized governance in our world. Yeah. Which is very interesting because we've had what? Like 200, almost 50 years of this U.S. governance and it's been like pretty good. The Constitution's good. But it's centralized. And now we have blockchain, we have all of this technology that helps us decentralize things. Well, it's beyond even decentralization. It's more the idea that when you look at any kind of theory, and the theory in principle and the theory in practice are so far removed from themselves that they're actually creating a cliff of divide, that divide is actually going to propagate through the minds of people that are practicing the philosophy. Because what we believe democracy is, or what we're taught democracy is, if we're even taught what democracy is, and what democracy has become in many instances in practice when you shift the incentives toward you know, that of capitalism instead of actually like the human humanization of what is meant to be the co collective good, the good of the commons, mm. then you're, you're fragmenting what, you're, you're fragmenting belief. Mm -hmm. And in fragmenting that belief, what people are doing is inserting the idea that belief is not belief in the functionality of the system. Belief is not the belief in the principle of democracy. Belief is belief in the principle that you associate with your self-identity. And in fracturing that principle of, you know, here's you know, are, are the good of the system, and then here's my self-interested good, what happens is we create partisan politics. And that's, you know, why we have these Republicans and Democrats and why people say, I hate all Democrats because I personally feel pro-gun or I feel pro, uh, you know, pro-life or whatever, or I feel anti either of those things and pro-marijuana. And we say that because I believe in this certain thing myself, that must mean that I believe in this thing politically. And in, in that entire train of logic, right, all people are doing from the minute they start saying that until the second they finish, it's just them literally sacrificing their agency and targeting other people instead of actually looking at a system's functionality and questioning whether that system is living up to its principle. And that destroys the, the destruction of the principle of the system in turn has been destroying the principles of our own humanity. So, you know, Aristotle didn't say, like, democracy is it. He wasn't like, democracy is like, that's my life mate. Mm -hmm. Democracy, he said, of the systems we know that exist, democracy is the best. It's the best of what we know, right? Mm -hmm. But what if the best of what you know is, you know, I've only in my life ever shopped in a very small local Walmart? and there are no local farms or what if the best of what you know is that you know what if the best of what you know is essentially something that's bad for you something that's maybe filled with preservatives or mm. chemicals that you don't know about not to, I'm not trying mm -hmm. to dog on Walmart here I'm just giving mm -hmm. an example of the way that you know the the underlying mechanics behind the way that we've thought about production and consumption have driven us away from the good of what is human life what is the good for human life and what is the good for my life right Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, it's all, all of this, uh, all of this symbolism is coming to a head, and what blockchain really represents in so many different ways is our ability to to recreate and to redefine that symbolism, and to say, are any of these Western systems, are we haven't always used these systems, right? Like, how do you think we managed our societies in like Sumerian times? like these super advanced yeah. civilizations like the Aztec, like the Maya, the Egyptians, right? Um, they all have pretty similar models, but their connection was always based on something bigger than what they are. And whenever you're only focusing on what you are, all of a sudden you feel like you're very big and everything else seems like it's either very small or the yeah. bigger picture doesn't connect with you because you're not imagining anything outside of what exists just in your own very narrow perception. Yeah. So yeah, I think what blockchain represents is not you know, the idea of, it's, it can represent many ideas, but it's a technology. Technology is used by humans. Humans generally respond to the incentives we create for them. So if we create better incentives in our technology, then we can see a shift in human behavior. If we change human behavior, then maybe we're one step closer to peace, but the healing starts in here. 
Yes. Yeah. The healing totally starts within and the decentralization is going to cause a good amount of healing in our future. Okay. You mentioned uh, as you were going there, you said that we have this new sort of conspicuous consumption capitalism that's kind of taking over this ego is getting pumped up we've lost kind of this sense of the cosmic perspective onto our civilization yeah. these things all in play are kind of causing what we're seeing and then yeah. this whole polarization of taking this thought and associating it with ourselves to the degree of which we will actually refuse to even empathize with the other person's thought because we are so in our own bias yeah. this is it's starting to get a little bit we're, we're experiencing a good amount of flux right now when all of a sudden kanye can just come onto twitter and just be like yo like make america great again and, and everyone's like whoa how'd that happen so there's like a bunch of things happening in the social fabric that are kind of disruptive yeah. and i want to learn more about exactly how we can yeah. We, how we can fix this with decentralization and, and how you're working on it. It's been a yeah. year at culture now. Yeah. Um, and that's going, and there's differences for people to, you were telling me about this earlier, yeah. for somebody that's coming onto the, to your platform now, it's uh, onto this decentralized platform that it's different for somebody that's a refugee that's yeah. just had their home taken away from them in Syria yeah. versus someone that is living in San Francisco that wants yeah. to get their voting record on yeah. the blockchain or their identity on the blockchain. So this is much different. Yeah. So, I mean, one, Kanye West is a performance artist. Kanye West is a performance artist. Kanye West is doing what every major media agency in the world is doing who wants control. What he's doing is he's playing with reality at a meta level. That's what Kanye is actually doing. He's, he's messing with everyone's sense of reality mm -hmm. in a way that is so unexpected mm -hmm. that he has control. Mm -hmm. Every, it's, it's he has the control because you can't control what is unexpected. Mm -hmm. That's the only way actually that a lot of people can either, you can have control in that way if you're a persona because then you're a bit more impervious to some of these like targeted grassroots insurgent attacks like we were talking about earlier. Um, and in doing that way, you're actually, you're, you're taking the incentives at a micro level that people are using to exploit media information and persona. And you're essentially saying, he's, he's essentially saying, nope. And he's taking that at a macro level and he's flipping it on its head, literally saying, I care so little about what people think of me because that is how they control me. I'm taking, what Kanye is doing is he's actually rebelling against that mentality and saying, I'm taking control of my own life. Mm -hmm. I personally think that Kanye West and Kim Kardashian are, are broad scale media geniuses. Mm -hmm. And watching, even watching the growth, I mean, you just have to really take a moment and step back regardless of principle or any of these things, what they've done from a meta perspective to structure the evolution yeah. of their persona yeah. is absolutely remarkable and, yeah. and not that not that it ever would be, uh, but shouldn't be understated. They're the genius that they both yeah. possess shouldn't be understated because they absolutely. really are, they really are uh, shifting what people perceive as reality. And yeah. there are very few people that have enough control over it to do that. Yeah. So um, it's a trip. It's it is literally a trip. And what they're realizing is that what's happening is like, it's, it's, it's literally like realizing that everyone around you is on opioids and you're like sitting up here, you're in like some kind of, you know, ayahuasca mm. or like, you know, you're in, you're in this, you know, uh, lucid, you're in this full lucid state. And once you're able to take that lucid perspective over reality, you're able mm. to take all of the people that are asleep and hopefully shift them into something greater. So mm -hmm. culture is actually a movement that I've yeah. been working on for, and that's what he does. Like he's saying that rather than being a slave to the culture that exists around me, I am literally taking this into my own hands and yeah. I am just, I, and, and at, at any expense, right? I would yeah. do it, I, not that I would ever do things the same way, because yeah. I definitely wouldn't, um, but it's, yeah, I mean, it's powerful. Right, it's powerful to have that level of control over your own life, especially when you get that big. Yeah, you know, uh, so it's all you know. There's a lot of it that's strategic, and then there's some of it that's just real 
and that's also what makes it so interesting. I've been working on culture for the last, like, actually five to seven years. That's uh, how just, long you've been working on just, it now. Just under different names. Um, okay. And it's, you know. But you've been aware of blockchain technology for that long? Yeah, bro blockchain's pretty much been my whole life and career. I found blockchain technology uh, when I was 20 years old. So I was studying, wow. you know, politics, economics. My actual degree was in advertising and propaganda theory. Mm -hmm. um, I noticed that, I thought that was super interesting, propaganda yeah. theory, yeah. which is what we're gonna talk about in a little bit also with media. For sure, Yeah. oh yeah. yeah. Uh, and then within the framework of that propaganda theory, I was also studying politics, economics, and philosophy. I was basically just studying, I was in college, but what I was learning was, I used college as a resource. So it's not like I was like, oh, I take these classes, so I only read these books. Like, I just go around and get syllabi for different classes and different reading lists, and I would mm -hmm. just talk to people. I just talked to professors, and I'd read stuff, and I've had questions, and I'd ask about those questions, and I'd figure things out, so. The quality of your life is the quality of your questions. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And so, and it's also, if you have resources at That's your disposal. That's why we ask the big questions on yeah. the show. Uh -huh. If you have research, which by the way, talking about hacking the simulation, we can definitely get into that. Mm -hmm. um, well, even globalization yeah. and wealth inequality yeah. and AGI and biowarfare and how do we maximize human yeah. potential, all these freaking questions that all of these different diverse leaders in their different fields, mm -hmm. let's test your perspectives about them. Let's get these thoughts to the world. Let's inspire more people around the world to have these conversations. Because yeah. what are we going to do in the future? How are we gonna have these children be birthed yeah. into the world? So yeah, what, the importance of this deep question and For the sure. importance of blockchain technology to where For are sure. we going? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and yeah, I mean, I think these are all questions that can't be answered and they can be answered individually from our perspectives, but the future is determined by all of us. Yeah. You know, and so, yeah. Some have more power and control like we were just talking about with yeah. Kanye and Kim. Well, yeah. it depends on how, what is the level of, I, I, I want to say cosmic awareness, but it's really like how broad and how high how meta is your perspective? Like how meta can you get in terms of the way that you perceive things? Because once you're able to take who you are, it's self-transcendence and remove it from the equation, you learn a lot more about what's actually happening because you're not trying to process things through the continual framework of you. You're removing you from the equation and in removing the idea of your own self-identity to kind of riff in the opposite direction of what I just said, when you're actually removing the idea of your relationship to yourself and your ego from an equation in a way that allows you to transcend what would be your normal perception, you're able to take in reality as it is. It's like the glass isn't half empty, it's not half full. Technically, the glass is always full because half of it's filled with air, uh, but you're literally looking at the glass as it just is. It is a glass, there is water in that glass. Like This is the state of reality. And in understanding that state of reality, you have more power to create a state change. You have more power to shift that mm -hmm. because you're not perceiving things mm -hmm. through the framework of a perspective. You're understanding that the sum of what I am in my existence and my perspective is an illusion of memory that I have built over the course of my life that I have lived and imagined. Because it's every time we try and remember something, you know where our memory really exists is dreams. Because every dream that we have, if we're exploring within our own consciousness, is created of the framework of the memories that we have stored in our physical bodies. Otherwise, all we would see is energy. Other, if we were just yeah, using yeah. our dream body and our spirit body to traverse across the world and the universe, all we would see is just the color of energy. Right, and these interactions and like these frames or these vignettes. But because we're living in an environment where we actually have a connection to the physical world, that's the only place memory is ever real. Other than that, it's the idea of you're existing in a period where your imagined memory is based on what you perceive is true to you. And what you perceive is true to you could be based on something unprocessed. You could be perceiving truth based on an unprocessed trauma and then continuing to create that truth because yeah. you still haven't connected with the God in you. Yeah. You know, so. Um, That's a great point. The foundation of culture is actually based on the idea that we as a society have to incentivize self-transcendence. Yeah. As, as a philosophy. Yeah. That if we're not gonna have peace inside of ourselves. Right at the top. Yeah, we can't have peace anywhere else. Well, I think the shape is changing, right? And that's the, the other thing that if we talk about like shapes How like can this, people self-transcend when they don't even have their base physiological needs met, right? That's gotta be this first. Easily. Have you been yeah. to India? 
I mean, they say in India there's a lot of pain and very little suffering because there are men like, um, my friend told me this story. He said mm. I was walking down the streets in India. He was doing this project for social good. And he says, I see this man. He's like very like braille, thin, like ribs everywhere. Just, you know, big old beard. And he's got a child with him. He's missing teeth. And it had just rained. And they're laying in a puddle and they're and they're loving each other and they're rolling around in this water because it had rained and mm. that meant that they could have a shower mm. and they could have a bath and they were joyous, mm -hmm. right? And that's because they have reached that place of self-transcendence because the spiritual culture there is very, very, yeah, very strong. Very mm. So you can reach that place no matter how much you have. You can come up from, you can have nothing. But then nothing. when they have yeah. an issue with their health, it might be more difficult for them to get an issue with their health or maybe his child's issue with his health. You could lose a yeah. child earlier due to improper uh, tend tending of their oh, health. Yeah. Um, and also, to, oh, yeah. it's very good to be spiritually connected enough to be able to roll, but in the puddle, so this is so it's interesting that yeah. you bring it up because I totally agree with you, but I also want to see there be some sort of a, that Agreed. base as well. Yeah. Yeah, so. and I think that that's going to be generated using blockchain as a tool. Once information can be quantified, we will understand that it is value. Once we can quantify all forms of value, we can actually create wealth. See you, time. So. So the last so, five, five years, though, of, of going through this process, yeah. of figuring this technology out and trying to bring it to our well, world. So the technology came to me really early. It wasn't about figuring it out. It was finding it and feeling like the questions had been answered. Mm. Because I was looking at the global economy going, we've been printing more debt than we have wealth for like 50 or more years. Mm -hmm. Venezuela is like 15th on the CIA's M1 data for money supply. They can't even stock at grocery stores with food. This is not, it's not even that it's not sustainable. It's that the illusion has gone so far that the fracture in reality, something is going to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, and we have to have, there's got to be, there has got to be something else, like there's got to be an answer. And blockchain, I believe in so many ways, is that answer. Mm. So when we think about it, talk about ideas like the infinite economy or like universal healthcare, things like that. So if you think about DNA, like DNA is a storage molecule mm -hmm. and you have like processing elements within your body, like the amount of transactions my body is making since we've been sitting here is mm -hmm. like, you know, in, in, the, in the billions, trillions, however many transactions my body's been making since we've literally just mm -hmm. been sitting down for this interview. Um, if we're able to actually look at our body as a source of information, right? What is, because what is blockchain actually? Like, what is Bitcoin? It's just ASIC chips that are mining and solving super complex math problems that increase at exponential rates. And once they're able to find the answers to those problems, it's actually generating, it's their, you know, they're getting Bitcoin for having solved that problem as a computer. You got a decentralized digital ledger. Yeah, it's a, it's a decentralized digital ledger, and in being a decentralized digital ledger, it's quantifying solutions to information problems. Yeah. Our body is literally just information, so let's say that if our body is solving, if we are solving problems in our body or we're using our body and the information in our body to solve health problems, it's the idea that what if you had that the people who have really rare diseases are actually really valuable because if we can figure out, if we can mm -hmm. use or cross-reference their own biological data with the other basic biological database of other people, we might be able to find a solution and a mm -hmm. cure. We might be able to eliminate, within, within the next century, we may be able to eliminate disease, mm -hmm. right? So just so, the way that information is reacting within our biology, if we could yeah. at least log that on the ledger and then be able to analyze the trigger of the pathology. There's so many people that have been on the show talking about biotech and we love yeah. that, those conversations. Totally. There's so many other applications totally. of putting things on the digital ledger. Yeah. We were talking about voting earlier, identity, yeah. property, marriage. There's so many things that can go yeah. on there. And there's so many cases of people losing things that are theirs due to there not being a paper trail of it being theirs uh, and who's in charge of the paper trail it's a when it's a centralized paper trail 
all of a sudden yeah. it can disappear with a little bit of lobbying, a little bit of pol politics, any of that. And that's, that's, that's unhealthy for someone's, yeah, yeah, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yep. This is serious, serious transition that we're in. Okay, so now it's been a couple years of analyzing this and embodying it as your you know, truth of how you see the world and how you want to solve a lot of the fractures that we're experiencing. Um, I kind of want to talk about the fractures a little bit more because we're talking, yeah. we'll talk about solutions and the fractures as we go, but yeah. this, this fracture of the media that's yeah. going on, and it's nice because we both classify ourselves as empaths. You've went to 30 straight days of meditation. For sure. I've went to three 10 days of meditation. Uh, it's been one of the most profound experiences of my life and it's helped me really tune into another person's being their sure. fullest being and my own fullest being and so in doing that I have learned that when I see people be so polarized I try and stay as calm and equanimous as possible try and stay open-minded try and stay loving and caring uh, ask really good questions and so what we've seen is, we were talking about this a little bit earlier, but this whole shift in people manipulating the fabric of the media in order to yeah. gain their own power. Agency. Their own agency. Agency. It's actually, and that's the, the scarier thing. The scarier thing is that we have some people manipulating the media at the, the mere attempt to just gain their agency because we've created a world where you have to be a certain way to be successful or to be a man or to be a woman. And all of that is utter BS. It is absolute and utter BS. You don't have to be anyone else's man, but your own man. You don't have to be anyone else's woman, but your own woman. And anyone who tells you differently, they're afraid. Don't buy into it. People will try to sell you fear everywhere you go. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. It's not worth it to make that kind of a deal. Just let it go. Just literally let it go. Um, yeah, I mean, the fractures are, in some ways I believe that it is our duty and responsibility to heal these fractures. And that's another core thesis. Reciprocity and restoration are two of the core theses underneath the technology that, have, that we're working on. And it's the idea that if you look at the governance in the blockchain space right now, Bitcoin forked because of a social fracture, because of a social political fracture, and also because of grassroots psychological insurgency. Because we had paid trolls come into the Reddit community as early as 2013, manning 5,200 Reddit accounts when the community was small, and going in to empower essentially the voices of trolls, and in doing that, start to fragment the community from within itself. It's pervasive, it happened everywhere because it was Is this invisible. a study of Reddit? Is, do they know? Yeah. They're, I, I don't know, I haven't called Alex or something, but, but it's, it, it is their claim that 5,200 no, accounts. No, 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 this was not someone from Reddit who I, contacted. I know, yeah. but, but Reddit analyzed the bot accounts. This is, no. No, who, no, who, no, no, who? this was, so this was a report. There's the best media publication that ever existed in the Bitcoin and blockchain world was a publication called Coinfire. Hmm. They were real journalists, and that's why they got attacked. They actually had someone try like DDoS, like they were just trying to shut them down. It was Coinfire was the most authentic, high integrity publication that existed in our industry, and the site got shut down. But the reporters are still out there. Wow. And they had someone, they contacted me about this story because I you know, co-founded and was the CEO of Cointelegraph, uh, and they, they're the first operational CEO ever. And they called me and they essentially said, you know, like, uh, we need help. We need help. And I'm like, what's going on? And they said, you know, we're being attacked right now because we're, we're getting this information and we're releasing the story. Mm -hmm, and I was mm -hmm. like, all right, well, tell me more. Mm -hmm. And the story that came out was the most, it was one of the most remarkable things I had ever seen or read. It was just someone who felt guilty. It was literally, and they had been known for being the most high integrity journalistic mm. publication in the industry. And someone essentially just contacted them and said, I will give you the logins and the passwords to all of these accounts. 
and wow. they gave them it was they gave them the passwords and logins to 50 different accounts. They had been some had been purchased, some had been operational for eight years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They had all been posting, so there were posts. It looked like this was real a real person accounts, because exactly. at one point in time it actually had been, right? And so you don't know. Like it looks like oh, this person's interested and in, like they have automated posts and like it makes it more difficult to tell if they're a bot or a human. They weren't a bot, that but that's the thing is that these aren't bots. They were operated by humans. These fifty two hundred. No, accounts. these are not robots. They're networks of psychological insurgency that are built by real people that are manning fifty to a hundred accounts on Reddit and have purchased accounts from other real people, men, women, different backgrounds, different interests, and are maintaining a normal posting schedule there and then using that same voice to fragment the Bitcoin community. This happens through Reddit, this happens through Twitter, this happens through Facebook. Mm -hmm. The number of people that are like, if you know, if you just accept every person who, oh, you have to so know what you're, screwed. yeah. Well, it's, oh it's also God, that there's there, so many pictures of freaking yep. women in bikinis trying to add men right now it's ridiculous and i'm sure the opposite is true for women getting tons of men as well foreign men these profiles you click them open they're from some random city they might have a mutual friend or two of yours because they've already accepted the request but they're trying to just mine your information yeah and manipulate you through their social yep. postings that say things like oh this certain news is being propagated and then you click it open and it's some random site that has no actual authentication yeah. and all of a sudden that's what we're seeing more and more of so who's doing this who's doing this who's behind this why are they trying to manipulate the fabric yeah what what's their incentive what do you mean why are they trying to manipulate the fabric because it is the most powerful form of what people are trying to control are the actions of other people i mean this is actually warfare mm. It is in, because the, the war that they're waging is in your mind. Yeah. There's no more powerful form of violence than a violence that you are responsible for. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the ultimate form of inaccountability. Especially when you don't know that it's happening to you. That's even worse. For those who are causing the violence, it allows them to remove or revoke any kind of accountability that they have in the situation. You go through seven other people to hurt another person, and the way that that person actually gets hurt is that they hurt themselves or they hurt someone else. Most people who do that aren't even aware. They're not even aware that they're becoming violent that they're either going on these, you know, they're going on this like whole train or they're like wanting to, you know, they're spewing hate speech or they're doing whatever, um, or they feel like they, they hate this other person and they want to fragment the community or they feel like they're at odds with someone um, and this person is their enemy and that's by design. It's not actually because this person is your enemy. It's by design. It's because you're being manipulated by everything that you don't see and understand, but it's getting to you because they know how to get to you. That's why you can't even Crazy. read. Don't even read. It's don't don't even engage. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't I barely use any of that stuff. Yeah, it's like, yeah. And if I do, I like don't. It's just like don't even engage with it. Don't even I don't use read it for the benefits of vocalizing your yeah. perspectives to the world, which actually helps a lot to put good content into the sphere. A lot of times I hear people say that I'm not using social media anymore because it's just too much of that nonsense. But then I also say that you are a brilliant person that has a lot of wisdom to communicate to the world. If you just took those little bits of wisdom that come to your mind and post them across Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, these major platforms, and just posted it there, and then just let other people read it and see it, they would be like, wait, there's actually good content on here too. And then we could over, overturn that as well. I wanna, I wanna ask about yeah. how what you're building is restoring that media fabric and, dis and not enabling the fracturing to happen so easily. Well, I'm not actually building, so I can tell you how it should be done. It's a platform that I created. Um, you know, it's, it's, I, I can tell you how it should be done. I actually have a few talks that, that mention essentially, here's the solution to this. Teach right? us. But that's not what I'm working on because I'm working on something from a, a different perspective and a different angle. It's just about being aware that these are the real problems and this is these these are the real political issues that are affecting citizens as well but how do you they're, get the I mean they're way in? bigger and broader issues than that but these are the ones that are at least in our control what were your talks that you give how do yeah. you get the awareness in though uh, just from that point before we go to what you're building what 
how do you the awareness in other people? How do you get the awareness in so that people maybe stay skeptical or stay super analytical, um, don't get driven by those emotional signals that come through the You need to, it's self-transcendence. I mean, it's self-transcendence. You have to be so aware of, not only it's not like what you are and what you are not. You just have to be so aware of our relationship to existence from a cosmological standpoint that you're able to take a God's eye view on some of this stuff. Because that's the only way you're gonna, that's the only way you're gonna make it through. Yeah. If you start looking at things super myopically and you start focusing on the trauma, you start focusing on the pain, you start focusing on the anger, you start focusing on the sadness, you're gonna, it's, it's just gonna keep existing because you're focusing on it. If you focus on the pain, the pain will continue to exist. If you focus on the light, if you look at things, it's great. And I'm not saying, it's not like I'm perfect. And it's not like I'm like, I always have this perspective and I'm like unaffected by everything. Like, mm -hmm. it's not, mm -hmm. that's not the case. I'm a person. Mm -hmm. um, and I just try to maintain, it, it's in the past, like, I've, you know, I've seen a lot of things like that. And I, I, it's, I hear yeah. you with the self-transcendent perspective. Yeah, and you just have to keep checking yeah. yourself. Yeah. over and over it's 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 a I recently continual posted process. about the importance of the mirror yeah. the importance of really looking in the mirror and focusing on self-growth and being very careful and being like i actually don't like that and then working on it and being okay with other people critiquing and being really driven to to work on oneself okay so how about yeah. what you're working on with chris allen so uh tell us a little bit about this this is yeah. really interesting so uh, Web of Trust is essentially, and so the company, my company is called Culture. And the foundation of the work that we're building is essentially universal access to legal contract rights outside of one particular jurisdiction mm -hmm. and a shift in our relationship to identity as something that is stewarded by a community instead of just like owned as a biometric or something like this. Mm -hmm. So Web of Trust is an open source standard running underneath Culture. And culture is essentially the ability for you to register your identity on Web of Trust. You can register it on like Civic or Jumio or through Facebook and social media or whatever, right? And you can pick and choose which identity, if not multiple identities, you wanna use to interact with the world. And then you essentially have access to all of these different blockchain applications and landscapes. So- I can have multiple identities. Uh, this is and this is a philosophical question that we can get into, right? Whoa! Uh, so with with web of trust, it's essentially the idea that you're. Now we can get really into that conversation because that's a philosophical debate. Um, you have to submit a DNA sample per personality. It might get that extreme. Well, and, and well, the digital it, world might be the only yeah. place where you can have an anonymous identity. Let's hope it doesn't. Um, but it's it's you already. Hope it does, but then, but then, how would if, it's not if, publicly? It's if already, if I yeah. could take five different personas and identify them through your, through a platform, then we're already experiencing a little bit of fragmentation of, of sorts because whatever the four ones that aren't this good standing one could do whatever they want with the plow. Right. So, so what do you quickly though on the philosophy behind that? What are, yeah, what so are I mean, and this is a tricky and complex question because there's the idea that you should only have one identity. Like that's basically Facebook's stance is like, you should only have one identity. I, I actually thought about this last night. Like I got into a deep, sometimes I get, I just write and I get into like this deep conversation with myself about our relationship to yeah. identity. But it's the idea really in our system that your identity is stewarded by your community. And your identity is not only relative to your identity, but what's really important about your identity when you're participating in different communities and cultures is your decision-making power. So you might have a bunch of identities and none of those identities may have decision-making power in any of the cultures or the tribes or the communities that you interact with. Sure, sure. So should you have, I mean, this is not, here's the thing, like, it, I, don't, I don't know if that's something I feel should be just like, there are certain people like activists, so for example, so to give you an example of where this would be oh, important. Oh, interesting. So if I'm living in Uganda and I am a, you know, let's say I'm living in Uganda and I'm gay and I want to marry my wife because I love her. Mm -hmm. And there was a period of time where Uganda was trying to pass a bill fueled by the way, by Western fundamentalists who came to Uganda, like super like hardline Christian, um, and they essentially, hard, I don't wanna say Christian activists, but I think that's probably how they would think of themselves. They came to Uganda, fueled a hate movement, and Uganda tried to pass the Kill the Gays bill. 
Uh, and so they now have an anti-homosexuality law where essentially if you, you it used to be the death penalty and now it's literally life in prison. It's that bad. So if I'm living in Uganda and I want to get married anonymously and have my community verify it, maybe gain access to some services or some rights or some anything, some whatever, you know, collaborative governance marketplace can provide for me, then I actually can't, I, I'm putting my life at risk, okay? If I have a public identity and I'm saying that, because the world has not reached the level that you're at. The rest of the world has not caught up with what you've reached, okay? You gotta maybe either give them some time or like figure, you have to essentially figure out a way to, there are people who are already living these two lives. So, so there's a yeah. good way to leverage five F fake personas that you control to try and increase the amount of conversation in Uganda around pro-gay marriage. No, that's not what I'm saying. And it's also the idea that if you have an anonymous identity and that anonymous identity isn't having any kind of interaction, you can be banned. So like if let's say a community is organizing you could and you get have- get legally yeah. gay married with an anonymous identity. Yes, when, I'm, when you use your anonymous identity, you're not necessarily using an anonymous identity identity frequently to interact with the world, but you'd use your anonymous identity to register different contracts anonymously that you and your like social network can verify or that you and your partner can verify. So you can have legal access to a system of contract law that exists outside of the bounds of a jurisdiction that may try to oppress you for owning your rights, right? So there's that's one- That's really important. Yeah. Right there, that's the yeah. highlight. Yeah. When the, that's the reason why. When a jurisdiction outside of you is trying to oppress you in some way, yeah. you then have the ability to privately l put something on the digital ledger yeah. securely over time. And, and, that, yeah. uh, and then you're on publicly, you can do go to the grocery store, et cetera, because yeah. that's not oppressive of sorts. Yeah, that's... Mm -hmm. But can you continue to keep, like, if you're using, like, these identities, first of all, like, they're all stored in one place. Right, and you can have one identity, like your civic identity is a public identity where you need to follow KYC and AML laws and you need a passport. You might have another identity like through Web of Trust where you're a refugee. But it's the idea that all of these things can be transparent and linked and you can see when someone is using an identity that's not a transparent identity. So you might immediately see like, hmm, okay, well, this person who's trying to interact with me, um, I don't know them and they're just using an anonymous identity. So if I'm a journalist, I might say this might be a tip right, from an anonymous whistleblower. Mm -hmm. But if I'm just a person and I'm interacting with another person and they come to me directly, just anonymously, I can say, no, like, or maybe I'll let like one message through, but I can say like, no, like I don't really want this anonymous person with no reputation or no identity to be able to contact me, like unless they are, yeah. you know, doing this or this or this. Mm -hmm. So the way that that works is essentially if you have an anonymous identity and you want to connect with someone, mm -hmm. you need a, a party of trust. Mm -hmm. So the way that this is outlined even in the white paper for Amira that's written for the Web of Trust Foundation is that it's the idea that Amira is an activist from Syria who was a child bride that escaped her abusive husband who has a position in the Syrian regime. She moved to Boston, she has a job at a bank that's a normal job, but she wants to give back to the world. And so in wanting to give back to the world, she engages in this situation where she sees this guy on TV and she's like, wow, he builds like he's building this app that's gonna shelter women that have been physically abused who really wanna contribute. But she can't contribute, <laughs> bless you. Thank you. She can't contribute with her own identity because she doesn't wanna be at risk, she doesn't wanna be found by the regime, she doesn't wanna be any of these things. Mm. So she contributes with an anonymous identity called Better World Hack. 23 but how does she, she even work at the bank without showcasing her identity she needs a social yeah. security number she needs these things witness protection i mean different, witness protection different kinds. i mean they sure. can be it can be different kinds of things okay. and you can also i mean the assumption in this case is that they would be looking for her and that, that any woman with this okay. kind of heritage or background would, would be, be someone for. that would yeah so okay so um, this is about protecting one's own health as well yeah. from for having this independent agency to move away from oppression somewhere else and then not be under the attack yeah. of that regime okay but the important element of this is that if she's using, I'm not talking about that identity. The identity that I'm talking Correct. about for her that she'd use our system for is the anonymous, anonymous identity, identity. Yep. that she would use to essentially say, I don't want to use my public identity because I feel I could be at risk. Harmed, yeah. So the only, the way that she connects with him, like she could reach out to him using her anonymous identity, but probably have like low latency. So she finds a mutual friend who knows him. That knows 
that knows and the guy the, who's running the nonprofit. Okay. And the mutual friend essentially says, Ooh, I can vouch tough. for her. That might be a lot of connections. And say, yeah, it show. might be, yeah. right? I can vouch for her and so say, it's, it's going to be, comp like the system it's a is. trail of vouches for the person. You can, you can have a trailer like the six degrees of separation or connection, and you can say, well, I trust this degree at this level or yeah. this person at this okay. level. So you can have this person essentially say, Charlene, introduces her to this guy, Bob, mm -hmm. and she says, I can vouch for Better World Hacker 23 and say that Better World Hacker 23 is like an excellent programmer. And so he says, okay, well, let's engage in this agreement, and I'll, you know, for the first month, show me that you're a good coder, contribute work to this project for free. Yeah. Then they create an agreement. Then once he says you're a great coder, she gets to continue to contribute to the work because he says, okay, she's right, you are a great coder. And then what happens is he starts building up her reputation for her anonymous identity. And, okay. So it's not like cool. anonymous identities exist in a way. Right now what's happening is that we have anonymous identities that are able to proliferate at this regard because there's very little accountability. But if you place an anonymous identity in the hands of a community that's stewarding it, yeah. then the model shifts because you're actually saying my identity is not just my identity. My identity is the way I exist subjectively. It's also the way I exist objectively. My identity is the communities of reference that I associate with. And my identity is also the skills I have to offer the world. So you start to get this portrait of who a person is that's beyond just one, the, the sum of one username or mm -hmm. handle. Mm -hmm. You're actually saying I exist as a process of the way in which I relate to the world around me. And in that way, once we're able to gain perspective on that, we're moving people closer to the idea of what it means to take this kind of God's eye view and self-transcend. Yeah. So it's, it's the idea that we huh. really, once you change the model to community stewardship, a person who is seen or perceived as being anonymous, you, and you might say you might feel comfortable talking to anonymous people. Oh, and you might oh, probably. Be, and you might yeah. say, yeah, sure, like I don't care. I would need an anonymous profile as well. I have things that I'd like to contribute outside of the yeah. uh, the social fabric that I think would be very, uh, very uh, inspiring that other people should hear, but that I do choose not to right yeah. now. Um, as much of an open book that we are here, there are many things that we just cannot say on the program that we would like to say. Is that right, Ron? Yeah, I've got nothing to hide. <laughs> no, I don't care. I don't need to be anonymous. I'm, uh, I'm ready to go. Interesting. So then there's people that don't care at all about anonymity. Yeah, and then a lot of, most people. Most people don't at all. Most people won't. Most, most people have no need My to God, be... I would publish the most crazy medium post about civilization design <laughs> if I could just be totally anonymous. I'll, I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll but, post it and say my but, anonymous friend asked me to, because uh, I, like, I wouldn't, I but, would never have an anonymous identity because I just don't, I'm like so full, I, I would never have, for me, I don't really have a need, like I'm transparent, like I hang out with my, I say this is like a joke, because my, I'll give my friends passwords to my stuff. And I'm just like, here you go, I'm like here, they're like, oh, do you like want to unlock your phone? And I'm like, there you go. And they're like, people are kind of taken aback, and I'm like, listen, I don't care if you, I don't really have anything to hide. I don't care if you read my emails, just as long as I'm consenting. As long as I'm consenting to you doing yeah. it, that's one thing. But if I'm not giving you the consent, then there's a problem. And that's really what the, our relationship to anonymous identities is gonna be based on consent, and it's gonna be based on community stewardship. So you have to consent. Like you can say as a person, through this identity, like I consent to receive messages from any kind of identity, any anonymous identity, sure, or I, sure. I consent to allow anonymous people into our community, but it's that layer of consent, and you're starting with that layer, you're setting the bounds first, and you're setting the boundary. So if you're like, you know, I'm, I want people in my community, if you can't be who, if you can't show your real identity, or you can't have someone who's in our immediate circle vouch for your identity, yeah. then that's an access point that we're gonna put over here. And you can be a part of those communities that have these different standards, but if you want access to our community, our, we have these re requirements for access. It's kind of like you know, being an accredited investor. So let, let's unpack the example again, because I think yeah. it's really important to do so. So we have um, a woman that may have fled an oppressive regime that now works in, within the United States with a public identity, just working normally, uh, just in case anything happens, 
but she finds something that is very inspirational, but that could get her in trouble. So she finds a, a, a private identity, an anonymous identity, and starts working with that organization through a connection network that enables them to say, okay, we trust, we trust, we trust. Okay, sure, start coding. Okay, coding's good enough. Maybe she starts getting paid by them. She starts contributing to them. That's yeah. good stuff. So that's an example of an anonymous use. So there probably will be uses of this anonymously in this profile will get built up and so that's really good so that's is that would you say that's your primary case example of culture of the importance of what you're building so I'd say that's the importance of of web of trust mm -hmm. web of trust is free web of trust will always be free it is an open source standard for people to own their rights sovereignly outside of the bounds. You could use this for refugees of a particular jurisdiction. So if a refugee wants to gain right now, essentially the, the process for immigration is a lottery. Citizenship's basically a lottery. Mm -hmm. Let's Sometimes see. money helps. Yeah, uh, money helps with pretty much everything. Um, but if you're a refugee and you don't have any of that, uh, it's basically a lottery whether or not you'll even get chosen. So what we're actually doing is saying, listen, we're creating this open source research and development institution and this is helping everyone make mm -hmm. more effective decisions. Because you can actually see if you're letting a person, if you're saying, well, I want to let this person into my community or into my like, you know, property or my country or my whatever, uh, maybe a country that exists, maybe a country that you create, then you're able to say, okay, well, I can actively see this person's a part of these communities, so we share some common ground over here. Uh, and there's, I can also see that this person has these skills. So, this interestingly ties into Trump saying that he wants the best refugees or the best immigrants and not just whoever the hell wants to come in. Well, the immigration process is absolutely, it's, it's horrible across the board. This is why you have people going into new nations and like, I, I went into Denmark I think about a year ago, and I was like, what? Because I hadn't been back in like mm. a couple years. And I went there a year ago, and I was like, oh my gosh. I was like, I called one of my friends, and I said, what's the deal? What happened? Like, what's going on? I was like, I've never in my life seen a homeless person in Denmark. Oh, wow. I've never seen a homeless person in Denmark. And she said, you're not going to like the answer. And I was like, I don't know. I was like, well, you got you to gotta tell me. You know, uh -huh. Like, why? What is it? And she said, they're refugees. They're refugees. And it, it, it was just so, I'd never had someone approach me on the street and ask me for money in Denmark, just mm -hmm. never. Mm -hmm. And so it's also a process where even these nations that have like these incredible you know, programs yeah. and social democracies or things like this, essentially like the Roman flag is like a unity mm -hmm. through division. It's like this big cross. And then when you look at all of the Scandic nations, they're all basically the Roman Empire leaning to the left. And then Jesus is like the Roman Empire at the pinnacle of power, meaning one is greater than the other. I mean, all symbolism is literally everywhere. And so, yeah. Uh, and so it's one of these situations where if they actually were able to understand, listen, okay, here's this refugee and they have skills as a carpenter, they speak English, they have effective skills as a teacher. They've been teaching people in refugee camps. We have these 40 people that they grew up with who can verify that they had this job or yeah. they did this thing. Then they're actually able to see, okay, not only can we like admit you, but let me like actively place you into a job. Yeah. Let me like get you a place to stay with people who you share a common community with yeah. that are willing to open up their house. And then let me help put you in a place where you're gonna actually be able to meaningfully contribute to society in a exactly. way that you're skilled or build your skills. Yeah. And so that it's connection's so important. I huge. love that. Yeah. It's huge. Yeah. Uh, because you know we a lot of people are coming into these environments where it's like imagine if you're new in a place and you don't even speak the language and you've just like lost half your family and you saw your house get bombed and you come into a new country and you're like you don't even understand that you have to pay to ride you know do I pay to ride the bus like I've yeah. not been on a bus I don't yeah. know what this language means yeah, and you're yeah. alone and wow. it's like you're any any person you when you go into a grocery store you That's just feel like path kicking in everyone yeah. you look at you're like no one here understands me everyone yeah. is staring at me I feel like I'm being ostracized yeah. for just walking down the street celebrating my culture and I said that I actually proposed this solution at a broad scale because people were talking about this and we were all concerned and I said have you ever like considered that maybe we should just throw a giant party and everyone was like this was in like a government office and everyone just looked at me and they were like 
go on. And so I said, you know, have you ever hung out with someone where you're like, you've just got this totally different background or this different experience and the way that you bond is that you just share something social and meaningful together. Yeah, yeah. Like, like when I went to yeah, college. Food or a drink or an event or whatever. But beyond is, is celebrating someone's culture. Like when I went to college, we celebrated holy. It was like everyone's favorite day of the year. Like you see all of these like Western kids that have never been to India and they have all these like, they're like got the typical college photo of them like covered in the holy paint dust, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. From the celebration of spring. Mm -hmm. And in that way, you feel like this, you, because you've had an experience with that heritage, you feel connected to it. Yeah. And so I said, have you guys thought about going through and actually taking the holidays or the celebrations from this culture and just celebrating them throughout the city. Mm -hmm. Organize a big party because then people are gonna have empathy yeah. because they're basically like, oh, I've, yeah. I've not only broken bread with this person, but I've broken bread with their tradition. Yeah, yeah. And it's beautiful. It's like, you know, you, we're, you, we'll show you what Christmas is like too, right? So uh, that's the, the mm -hmm. foundation of this is really about humanizing our relationship to each other and placing yeah. ownership more as a stu into a stewardship role. Um, taking the attitude of develop nations and actually uplifting what's meaningful about First Nations, about indigenous nations, right? Mm -hmm. Because if we took more time to steward our planet and the people that were in it, I think we'd all be a lot happier, healthier, and way more connected. Adding someone as a friend on Facebook doesn't mean you are connected. It means you're linked. Yeah, I liked how yeah. you said that it's not just about breaking bread, but it's also about breaking into their culture, then breaking into yours, and yeah. doing something to ensure that across the planet. We always think that, is it really going to take a an alien race identifying one outside of Earth to finally realize that we're all one here? I hope it doesn't take that long um, until we really figure out how to work together and help each other. Yeah. <laughs> So, so, all right, let's cover the examples of, let's do this quick because I want to get to a couple yeah. quick questions before the yeah. end. Uh, let's get to the examples mm -hmm. of the influence that culture is having in, uh, in identity. We did, yeah. we did identity with an anonymity uh, and non-anonymity. And then how about voting, property, all this other kind of stuff? What, yeah. yeah, so are these the other major uses? Uh, property, marriage contracts, education certificates, basically anything that you can register is a universal registration system. The original function of the nation state was essentially just that, like that was basically the function of jurisdiction. It was a way to organize things because we had tribal kings who essentially organized things with their memory. So you remember what I said about memory earlier, it's like the tribal king's memory isn't perfect, which it's not. No or one's memory perfect. Or paper ledger sometimes. Yeah, I mean, then it's like, oh, well, and then it moved into kings and queens where it's like, oh, everything's organized because I own it all. Mm. <laughs> so we mm. don't even have to worry about that. Mm. And then you made it into, and then we make it into nations, which nations essentially say, well, we're trying to give people different forms. They still have kings and queens, basically, like, you know, the Kennedys. Um, but it's, or like, regimes is a, used in different contexts, but it's a regime. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's the idea that you're giving everyone access at least to buy a house or to do a thing, and you're giving them a kind of ownership over their registration, which is controlled ownership. So what we build is universal registration. Where we're all hi. Hi. Uh, it's all, I'm also wearing it's my necklace as well. My you are. The logo. Yes. Yeah. Um, nice. You got one of those. Yeah, I'll get you some. That's yeah. cool. Yeah, we should hang one up in here. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, but it's also the idea that you're you're now having the universal registration. We're putting jurisdiction into the hands of every person on the planet as an individual, and the way in which we look at ownership isn't just the idea because it's like if you just register a contract on the blockchain, does that mean anything? Like. No, but when does it mean something? When people are organized. Mm -hmm. That's when it means something. Mm -hmm. Whether for bad, like I was talking about earlier with those psychological insurgency networks, or for good. To give people access to their rights and ownership over their rights. We can use that evil for good. Mm -hmm. We can use that evil for good. That's part of the foundation of the system that we're designing. And so, um, yeah, that's, it's, it's, that's what's core to culture. And then on top of culture is a really dynamic ecosystem. 
for uh, new forms of access economy and community. Because the future of government is not government. The future of government is culture. Mm -hmm. Yay. Nice, nice. So, it's good, good. All right, now we've touched on <laughs> at least a, a, an okay amount of what we've needed to touch on about your background yeah. and about what you're building into yeah. the world and the importance yeah. of it. So, how about a little bit of simulation questions? So, let's ask you about... I'm interested to hear your thoughts on this one. We're approaching an age of massive information technology across biotech and crypto and space and AI and robotics. There's yeah. so much technology. And it's kind of exacerbating the wealth inequality. And we're now getting close to about eight people have as much wealth as four billion. What do you think is going to happen with that gap of wealth inequality? How do we help that? Yeah. And then also, what's going on across the world with these technologies, yeah. with the China, Russia, US equation? And Ugh. yeah, unpack that a little for us with your thoughts. Yeah, so I mean, there's a philosophical way that we could talk about ideologically how this could work, and then there's the reality of the idea that all of these countries might try and homogenize and control their own things, so. Mm. Meh. Okay, uh, which one do you lean more in the direction of? Depends on how organized people are, frankly. And it depends on how much we like to play together rather than separately. Right. Yes, exactly. Yeah. United we stand, legitimately. I, I, I hope so on Earth. I, I, hope, I hope so. Yeah, for sure. I hope so. Uh, so addressing the idea of this kind of like emergent wealth, I mean, the, this is by design as well. You know, We have a third world country pretty much in the United States. Mm. Drive through San Francisco if you like to question whether or not that's true. Just, yeah, sixth just, and market. Just drive through. I have yeah. seen through maybe like I could I could take you to at least five to seven side streets that are literally probably actually more than that that are literally yeah. just homeless villages. People yeah, they have are. started making yeah. houses out of like like sh uh, like shanty structures. Shanty structures. Tents, outside yeah, of yeah. like wood, just basically wood tents or things like that, like propped up with sticks. And there's there's a whole there's whole there's tent row. There's hazard needle depositories. San Francisco has spent thirty million dollars this year cleaning up needles and feces from the street. Yeah, and then you have Rincon Hill, which is fucking right over there by the Bay Bridge, where a condo costs twenty five million dollars. Yeah. yeah, rent for a one bedroom apartment is five thousand dollars. If you factor in what the salary is for most Americans and how much it costs to live in San Francisco, you, you wouldn't be able to eat living here. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's a, obviously a very serious problem and I think the way that we solve these issues is by giving people access. And I think that what's gonna happen is all of this information, like people talk about the foundation for UBI, and the foundation for UBI is actually the quantification of information and the individual's ability to take ownership over their own data because your data is a resource. Like I was talking earlier with your body, whether the data that you generate is content, whether the data that you generate is your biological information, maybe you have a very unique eye color, maybe you have a very unique genetic pattern, where, whether the information that you generate is measuring the quality of the air in your area, maybe the information that you generate is living in Africa and you're using your cell phone to take a, a VR, like essentially using your cell phone to scan the world around you in a way that runs it through a program that can immediately translate it in real time, hopefully, into a virtual landscape. So you're essentially creating the empathy machine by just showing people this is what it's like in rural Sierra Leone and maybe yeah. that's a form of you're contributing meaningfully to society or to a project. So the way I think this will play out and this is really you can get to paid for your data. Yeah, yeah. for anything yeah. you generate. We, we've value. been talking about yeah. UBI being the uh, data being the source, data you generate being yeah. the source for UBI. Yeah. As long as people actually pay you, hopefully, hopefully we get well, there. Well, the systems will be designed that way. And if they're not designed that way, then imagine if someone said, you could get paid for this or not get paid for this. You would take the option that said, I would like to be paid for it. It's really that actually simple especially when the information is stored on a blockchain in a way that can make the information anonymous 
it just just as information, right? The only people who would have access to the information would be intelligences. You can have a network of decentralized artificial intelligences that are running on top of this network, and they're essentially looking at the information as our relationship, not to our subjective identity, but as information's relationship to other information. Yeah. And so if you needed subjective help, you could have a personal AI that is specifically for you. All of these AIs should be decentralized consciousnesses. We don't actually You know fear Dan Gailey from Synapse AI? Yeah. No. We should definitely connect I think I've heard his name. Yeah. Um, but we don't fear AI. We fear the centralization of power. So if all of these things are decentralized and they're solving problems together rather than saying like all AI is owned by one thing, that's what we fear. Because absolute power will be absolutely abused. Absolute power destroys absolutely. And so if you have a personal AI, it can know who you are. And then all of these other AIs can be invisible processing information and mining meaning out of that. Whenever mm -hmm. AI is just like, whenever an ASIC chip solves a math problem and that math problem generates an answer and that answer generates meaning and the meaning generates Bitcoin, where essentially we're changing the process of we're going from, like I said, it's value and information into meaning through meaning and wealth, wealth and meaning, right? Mm -hmm. So whenever we're able to actually generate meaning from that information, yeah. then we can have the distribution of wealth. And we're all generating meaning all of the time in pretty much every moment. And you have access control over how much of your data that you want to give out. And then there's yeah. these benevolent um, AIs that are running to figure out what is the meaning coming from the data. Okay, so this is potentially a solution to the wealth inequality. People actually getting paid for their data that they're contributing, whether it be your biometrics mm -hmm. or whether it be um, taking that VR yeah. video within yeah. within a specific place in the world, or any kind of generating content like what we're doing right now, like attention, yeah. time, every every variable that exists in the world, time, our relationship to the way we move through space, perception, attention meaning, emotion, reaction. Our emotions are information. The way that I react to it, if you say yeah. something to me and I yeah. react in a certain way, that's actually meaningful information. Yeah, if you react calmly, <coughs> salute. If you react <laughs> calmly versus if you react agitatedly, yes, that's or, very important information, especially yeah. for uh, when they test astronauts for the International Space Station. Is yeah. that cool? Or, yeah. even, or even growing from that. What might actually be valuable is that one time someone says something to you and you react in a certain way, and then another time someone says something to you and you respond differently, and your reaction to the situation shows that you've grown. So all of these things, and like that's an every, yeah. the idea is like yeah. also that the amount of information we're processing so constantly, people think that information is like what is seen. Like uh, you put a blog post out, like yeah, that's yeah. doing something. Like that's, the that's weird good. processing. I like that. Information is yeah. what's unseen as well. Oh, that, yeah. That's really well said. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cause the, the, exactly your reaction. Yes. If you've grown as a human uh, through your reactions, yeah. that's, that's yeah. or, or if we're doing some natural language processing on your work yes. and we're seeing that you're writing about things that are maybe a little bit more higher level, you've been reading, you've been learning. Yeah. Oh, you get a little more money for your data, good job. Yes. Yeah. The invisible information economy will generate mm. infinite wealth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I like that. All right, let's, let's jump you into, uh, do you think we're alone in the cosmos? I don't know what it means to be alone. I think that all forms of consciousness are connected. I think the cosmos, so, so the question is interesting for me because the cosmos are a consciousness. So the very relationship of the language in that question to its answer are at odds because are we alone in the cosmos? Uh, like the cosmos are a, alive. They're a consciousness themselves, just like earth is a consciousness. Um, are there ever, advanced civilizations roaming the cosmos? The cosmos are in an advanced civilization in and of themselves. The cosmos are, there are higher, in advanced. Uh, are there more advanced civilizations than ours roaming the cosmos? It's, it's the same relationship. The relationship we have to the broader, higher consciousness of the cosmos is basically the relationship we have to Earth. It's like we're right in the middle of these two, four, and they're both pretty benevolent, right? And so if you look at Earth, it's like if you... There's an experiment from Harvard. It's like one of my favorite things to reference in terms of people saying, I've, I've had people go, oh, like, Earth is a consciousness. Like, that sounds really, and I'm like, the, if you speak to plants differently, mm -hmm. they will grow differently. That's true, yeah. If you play different music, yeah. if you look at a plant, you're like, I hate you, plant. And yeah. you look at a plant, and you're like, I love you. 
you so much. You're the best plant. Yeah. They, they respond. Yeah. The earth is a living, breathing organism that actually created human life, but... From space, you can literally see the ice caps melting oh, yeah. and For sure. making snow and melting making snow. It looks like yes. breath. Yep. Yeah. Even though earth created us, she's not the full source of life. We are more of the cosmos than we are of apes. We as a human race are we're more are of the cosmos than we are apes. Yeah, yes. yeah, okay, sure, sure. But it also seems as though we're all of that at the same time, though. But I wrote a haiku a while ago, and it's, the tides of life are a cycling progression meant to merge man and God. Yeah, that's good. I like that yeah. haiku. That's a really good one. Yeah. So yeah. I think that what we're experiencing as a consciousness is we're essentially just spiraling upward and outward. Like, our, here's what's happening. Like, our consciousness was here. It was like this little dot. And our consciousness is going like this. And then it's just continuing to expand mm -hmm. until we reach a point of expansion that can compare to the cosmos. So it's, it's all like a forms. galaxy forming over time. Yeah, and right? then the once solar system. all of our consciousness reaches that, it's like we, but we're, we're continuing to go through that cycle at a micro scale. And then there's also that cycle happening at a, at a macro level. It's the same relationship that we have to the Hindu perception of time. We talk about the Hindu perception of time is categorized into four yugas. This is also related to Mayan astrology and Mayan astrology having the calendar that says the world's gonna end in 2012. They didn't actually mean the world is gonna end. What they meant is that that era of time is coming to an end between 2012 and 2018, right? It's the end of the Kali Yuga, which is what I call the golden calf age. It's like materialism, degradation, like false idol worship. We just finished the Kali Yuga. And we're entering into the Satya Yuga, which is the golden age where the gods and goddesses reign. And these periods of time are actually relative to Earth's relationship, not only on its own like wobbly axis kind of thing, <laughs> my definition of a wobbly axis, but uh, not only Earth's definition to its own rotation, but Earth's definition of its rotation uh, closer to and further away from the center of conscious energy in the universe. So we're moving back toward mm -hmm. that center of conscious energy in the universe, which mm -hmm. is what gives um, our own humanity, our relationship to what I call like second sight or even like sacred geometry. If you look at like the pyramids, the, you know, sacred sites in, in yeah, Mexico yeah. and in Cusco and the wind China and in Egypt, like if you look at Giza and you take a, the face of an Egyptian uh, statue and cut it in half and then you flip one side of the face and overlay it. I mean, it's literally, and then you overlay that with the original image it's literally perfectly symmetrical. Mm -hmm. We were able to do this because our consciousness was in a higher state. And then all of a sudden it's like, what, what happened is we started taking all of this information that we experienced, right? Like we started taking the experience of higher consciousness and instead of experiencing it, what happened is people tried to start owning it. They, they started to grasp it, right? And they started to try and use this to control because we were no longer in the connection in, at that, that high point of energy with the universe. We were moving away from it. And when people start, when we start to move away from essentially the center of conscious energy in the universe, what happens is we start to essentially crush our own minds yeah. into, into this kind of like, it's like we're here and then we expand and, and we contract. expand outward and then we're contracting and then yeah. we're expanding, but we're going through that process over and over again in one broader spectrum that is a continual expansion of consciousness until the meta, meta perspective of what is like our quantum relationship to consciousness reaches again the, the same point that our initial consciousness experiences every like series of four yuga cycles that we go through. I like how you describe the vicissitudes of consciousness because I don't think the ups and downs of consciousness are described at a meta civilizational level. Most of the time they're described at a individual level so it's good to see and feel them really contracting and expanding contracting because i we do discuss quite a bit on the show the previous uh tribes of humanity that have yeah. been very conscious and so sure. uh, why are we here now with yes ubiquity in food and water in many cases but also the proliferation of the media culture uh, yeah, I like it. <laughs> okay, do you think we're in a computer simulation? It's not a computer simulation. The simulation is our relationship to our own consciousness. It's funny to me because man... 
Okay, so someone else is not altering, uh, playing it's, with the code of our program. I mean, listen, it's funny to me because this is how like man contextualizes things, right? Man looks at a thing and it's like, especially in this age, and we're, we're taking what exists as an inherent property of our consciousness and we're essentially giving our power away and saying like the world is just run or created by a machine. Could be. No, this isn't an Asimov story. Like, could be. I love Asimov, don't get me wrong. All of the spirituality um, could be programmed as well. But All it's, it it's, it's the simulation is that we're, we're merging back into our relationship with higher consciousness. So what's happening is we're experiencing our own quantum perception in real time because the age is shifting. It's not a computer. Computers are from us. You know what I mean? Computers are from us. It's, yeah, but it's like fire. The, the it's like the programming of the quantum world and the, the string theory yes, world. Yes, but is the, the programming of the quantum world is happening from consciousness. Computers are a reflection of consciousness. That that the idea that we are like, are we in a simulation? Yes, but the simulation is that what's happening is we have four bodies that exist at once. Okay, we have our real time body that exists here. We have the body that we experience in dreams, which is our non-physical body, which uses non-physical energy. And then we have our quantum consciousness. It is the version of ourselves that exists in a higher dimension that's able to watch over us through a lens of time that is not relative to material space. We exist in a quantum state. Right? We, we exist in, in not only two places at once being here, we exist in two places or maybe even more at once in the universe. They say like be a witness, like that's you tuning into what's actually happening upstairs. So it's, it's really about the idea of our relationship to consciousness. It's, our relationship to consciousness is a simulation. We're just waking up to the fact that we, we perceive time falsely. We think that time is, well, not falsely, it's just relative to the dimension of the age and the dimension of our relationship to yeah. consciousness and the center of energy in the universe. We think that time is like a line, uh, like Western time is a timeline or Eastern time is a circle. Even the yugas are a circle, but it's not a line or a circle. It's something closer to a dot. Yeah, we've been hearing razor blade on the show a little bit. Yeah, time is happening all at once all around us at once. And we're able to access this perception. This is why I teach people lucid dreaming. We can access this perception of time in dreams. Yeah, we did a little astral projection on our previous show. Yep. Just the very last one. Yep. So, okay, Tony Lane, question about <laughs> what is the deepest emotion you've ever felt? Hmm. I don't think there's a word for it. What was, what was the feeling like? Um, because it's beyond, the idea of the deepest emotion I've ever felt is an idea that there is an emotion that is beyond the sum of feeling because it's an out of body experience. Mm -hmm. People quantify that with words like, but they are overused words that I think people represent falsely. Like, what, what is it? like bliss uh -huh. or love or ecstasy or any of these other, you know, um, I think it's the most real emotion I've ever felt because it's the thing that makes you more aware of the idea that you're existing beyond your own physical body. Beautiful, beautifully I would, said. Source is how I would describe it. Mm -hmm. Source is the deepest and most intense feeling I think I've ever felt. Source. Source. Yeah, I like that a lot. All right, what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? Uh, there is no most, for me, there is no most. You know what I actually think is beautiful? Um, what other people perceive to be ugly but is, but is true of heart. Hmm. That, I think, is the, is the real definition of beauty. That's beauty is not what is just seen as beautiful. Real beauty is when you'll see something that is beautiful and that is hidden. Mm -hmm. and the rest of the world looks on this, this book called by Umberto Eco called On Ugliness. And it's maybe my love art history and it's maybe my favorite art history book that's ever been written because it contextualizes ugliness in art in the way that almost all other art historians work to contextualize beauty in that real beauty is like Cyrano de Bergerac. 
it is the man who is ashamed of the way that he looks, hiding in the bushes, having another man read his poetry to the woman that he loves mm. in an attempt to help her be happy. Yeah, that's because good stuff. Because that is the beauty. Do you know why that's real beauty? Because that is the beauty that more than any other form of beauty needs to be seen yeah. and appreciated. Yeah, yeah, I agree. That, that brings actualization to people. It brings transcendence to them. It brings them meaning and value and fulfillment from their tribe. I, I agree, that's, that's good. That's very unique. We haven't had that one for sure. Also, the source answer was really good as well. Yeah. Tony Lane Casserly. Wow. What a great conversation. Yay. Yay. Did you have fun? Yeah. Good. Yeah. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for Appreciate having me. Appreciate it so yes. much. Yes. Thank you. For sure. Thank you. This has been such a pleasure. I think that we have a lot to still unpack. Yeah. And we'll have to do another session sometime soon. Yeah, so much to unpack. That was oh, a lot yeah. of fun. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Everyone, if you had a good time watching, definitely share this content. Please share it. We need more people talking about these thought-provoking subjects. Join us. Subscribe. Hit that subscribe button. Join us in the community. Give us a comment below with your thoughts. Give us a like. Join us on Patreon. We need to sustain our studio. We need to sustain our electricity, our food, our internet, all that stuff. Join us. Let us grow. Help us blossom. We need people chopping up these videos and getting these clips. Join us there. We'll have Tony Lane Cassidy's link in the bio, all the description there. So we will see you soon. Thank you for tuning in. Woo!